Here we are getting close to the end of day one. We're approaching session four. After this, there'll be a Q&A. Uh, this is the U.S. Biochar Initiative, Biochar Funding Opportunity with the USDA and RCS Code 336 and 808, the Soil Carbon Amendment. Next up, Michael Margo will give an overview of conservation practice standards. Then he'll go deep into the Soil Carbon Amendment, conservation practice standards 808 and 336. We need to thank our sponsors for making this program possible. Now, here we go with Michael. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, welcome back from break. This is John Webster. I'm the Director of Communications for the U.S. Biochar Initiative. Today, we have a deep dive into the NRCS Soil Carbon Amendment Practice Standard. We're looking at Code 336 and 808. It's going to be a fantastic conversation. The first half of our day was loaded with excellent questions uh, from attendees and lots of great insight from the presenters. So right now, what we're doing is we're going to get going with uh, Michael Margo. He is the Acting National Soil Health Specialist. And uh, Michael, take it away. Okay. Thank you, John. And uh, hello, everyone. A pleasure to be here. A lot of great, it's great to see so much interest and in, uh uh, with NRCS and, and our and our new one of our new practice standards. Okay, I'm going to start off uh, first uh, two or three slides, just a little bit about the soil health division. Uh, I've been acting uh, as a national soil health specialist since last July. So uh, we support the NRCS mission by providing the best available soil health science, technology training, guidance, and technical resources to NRCS employees, customers, and partners in order to improve the health and function of our nation's living uh, and life-giving soil. Um, we amplify our con NRCS's conservation planning and implementation efforts, and we add uh, conservation and economic value to the farming and ranching enterprises of NRCS customers through integration of soil health. Uh, the soil health division focuses its soil health training and technical leadership efforts to help the agency provide comprehensive and effective support on the use of soil health assessments and the planning and implementation of soil health management systems on our nation's working lands working in coordination with NRCS, NRCS state and national entities. Uh, we uh, have a, uh, within the soil health division, we have a, we focus on, we have some focus areas of strategy, policy and communications, uh, assessing emerging soil health issues. Uh, we're looking at uh, implementing strategies for priority needs, and uh, developing uh, uh, policies and guidelines like the Conservation Practice Standard 808 and other manuals and tech notes and, uh, and tech uh, fact sheets that would be available for technical service providers and, and employees. Um, we, another focus area is science and technology development and acquisition. Uh, we identify and communicate soil health research, technology development, transfer, implementation, and training needs. We evaluate new science, technology, and producer experience in implementing soil health management test systems. And that science and technology is what help guide you know, the development of our conservation practice standard. We need development of technical priorities for soil health focused conservation innovation grants, soil health demonstration trials and agreements, and lead technical oversight of projects. We assist states, Pacific Islands, and Caribbean areas uh, with leading soil health related projects and demonstra demonstration projects or field trials. And all this uh, technical support to, uh, for NRCS voluntary conservation programs. You know, we also focus on training, technical assistance, and technology transfer. Uh, acquire, develop, evaluate, and disseminate new soil health technologies to solve natural resource problems and other technical issues in support of the field delivery system. Uh, we provide national leadership and cons consultative uh, services for strategic management of soil health education, training, and technical assistance capacity of NRCS. 
and capacity building to the states and, and uh, Pacific Island and Car Caribbean areas to facilitate, facilitate effective field office and partner use of soil health assessments and interpretive tools for management, planning, and implementation of soil health management systems. And uh, within the soil health uh, division, we have uh, 14 um, uh, regional soil health specialists that provide uh, uh, support to the states. And uh, we, it's divided into the west and to the east. We have uh, team leaders. Uh, we also have an urban focus area. Uh, the big bullseyes across our, our kind of our urban focus areas within the United States. Uh, we have an indigenous practices team. And uh, there's uh, the uh, regional soil health specialist. Uh, each regional soil health specialist provides support for a certain number of states within their area of responsibility. Um, I'm based out of uh, national headquarters with Amanda Branham, our director, and other support staff um, uh, uh, scattered throughout the country. Okay, so now uh, with that, I'm going to go into uh, definition of a practice standard, and uh, it's a structural vegetative measure or management activity used to protect or reduce the degradation of soil, water, air, plant, animal, and energy resources. Uh, uh, Matt has uh, you know expanded and has talked uh, about the resource concerns related to um, uh, soil, water, air, and plant, animal energy resources. We delivers technology based on allowable criteria to adapt the technology to the site. And there's approximately 164 current practices in our national handbook of uh, conservation practices. Uh, there's some supporting materials that um, for states is uh, some implementation requirements and some and the payment scenarios that we've been talking about that are associated with each uh, practice standard. As Matt mentioned earlier uh, this year, uh, you'll see two identities, <clears throat> same name, Soil Carbon Amendment 808. The number 808 was assigned to the interim practice, which uh, was created in 2018 for evaluating. That's basically how all new standards, um, permanent standards, pretty much are born. Basically, they are created uh, based on a need. States, there's a, a few states that uh, sponsor it for evaluation and refinement. So between 2018 and, and here up until recently, uh, last year, uh, there was a lot of internal reviews and comments, uh, over 550. And when those were incorporated into an updated standard that was sent out to the Federal Register uh, last year, uh, where we received over 500 comments uh, on the standard. And, and many um, great input and information from USBI, US Composting Council, and among many others. And all that information uh, and, and scientific research and uh, was all used for you know, the development of this standard. And I definitely won't uh, take credit, you know, for this development. This has been ongoing since 2018. Uh, and many of my predecessors, Brandon Smith, uh, Rachel Seaman Varner, uh, and many others uh, who were working on these standards and, and at the time, um, you know, got it to, you know, where it is now. And uh, so, so the 336 I did want to mention is the code for the permanent standard soil carbon amendment. It incorporates all the comments and reviews uh, that uh, were based out of the 808. So for this fiscal year, fiscal year 23, um, uh, there are two standards uh, available. There's payment scenarios, as Matt mentioned, uh, are only associated with 808 for this fiscal year. And for fiscal year 24, they, the uh, 
payment scenarios will be reevaluated, adjusted, and attached to 336. And every time you go into your state's field office technical guide, you will see only sole carbon amendment 336 uh, if, if they have adopted uh, and you won't see 808. So this is the last year of seeing the 808 number. Um, I know there's a lot of questions on uh, unrelated to, uh, you know, which states have adopted uh, the standard. And this year states, because 808 is that um, standard, there's only 808 payment scenarios. So states for fiscal year 23 are still adopting 808. But when uh, the, these are, these, this 808 and 336 is first released, the final standard was released in November, 2022. It is a national standard and states, uh, if they choose to adopt it, um, work with, uh, uh, develop their own standard. And that's why we point um, end users to their state field office technical guide to uh, look at the Arizona uh, 808 standard or Arizona 336 standard, because Arizona may uh, add some additional considerations or uh, restrictions based on local state policies related to um, amendments that a, a neighboring state may not have. So they use the, the national standard to kind of uh, modify uh, uh, slightly, and there are restrictions. It can be changed uh, drastically or anything, but there's, it can be uh, made, uh, slightly more uh, restrictive based on local uh, policy. Uh, policies that and requirements that they, they need to adhere to. Uh, we have 28 states as of right now that have adopted the 808 standard. And uh, I also mentioned that there are 10, I mentioned earlier that there are 10 payment scenarios associated with uh, the sole carbon amendment 808. Um, uh, some are compost only, comp, uh, and in the mix of biochar and compost of different percentages, there are some payment scenarios for small areas, focused in the urban settings, but not all the states may choose not to adopt all payment scenarios. Uh, some states do, and other states uh, may just be focused on you know, just biochar or just the biochar compost mixes. And um, so what do you do if your state is not listed here and you're, you know, really, you're a producer, uh, a farmer, a rancher that's interested? Uh, as Matt mentioned, that shouldn't uh, discourage you from, you know, still applying and contacting your local field office uh, because the, the demand at the local level will drive the incentive for the state to adopt. Um, uh, there's, there's a process for um, that states need to overcome it. They are not listed here, and there is an application that has come in um, that is um, looking for the adoption of a sole, looking for the application of sole carbon amendment. Uh, but there are uh, state technical advisory committees. Uh, the state conservationist is, is the chair of state technical advisory committees, and various states um, have. Uh, meet at various times, whether some states meet quarterly and state uh, advisory, uh, state technical advisory committees sometimes have a uh, representative of a farmer or rancher organization represent, having a seat on that committee. And if you're a member of that organization, that's a good opportunity to you know, voice your interest in this new standard in the state that you know, it's something we, we would like to implement. Um, you know, reaching out to, um, uh, to uh, reaching out to your state conservation is, is also uh, another um, method of uh, requesting to uh, serve on the state technical advisory committee. And if you 
um, first can go to our NRCS website that we have shared in various slides. You can um, navigate to um, the uh, uh, your state contact. Okay, and so uh, going back to the uh, the actual practice standard itself, it has different sections, uh, definition, purposes, conditions where the practice applies to some general criteria, some additional criteria that may be specific for certain aspects, um, considerations, plans and specifications and operation and maintenance. So I'll go through all these different sections for uh, 336. So definition starts off and starts off with the definition: application of carbon-based amendments derived from plant materials or treated animal byproducts. And the purpose: it's used uh, use this practice to accomplish one or more of the following purposes: improve or maintain soil organic matter, sequester carbon, and enhance soil carbon stocks, improve soil aggregate stability and improve habitat for soil organisms. These purposes are tied to your, um, our resource concerns. I uh, briefly mentioned uh, there was a question about range. Um, this practice applies to areas of crop, pasture, range, forest, associated agricultural lands, developed land, Urban land is a modifier within uh, developed land, which is a small areas and farmstead where organic carbon amendment applications will improve soil conditions. Okay, then it starts off uh, and I'm just going down from the top of the standard uh, down through it. The general criteria, which is applicable to all purposes we want to plan and design and implement carbon amendment applications in compliance with all federal, state, and local laws and regulations. Um, the owner and or operator is responsible for securing all required permits for approvals and for applying uh, the amendment in accordance with such laws uh, and regulations. If evaluate and is. Uh, an important po a point I want to talk about, uh, expand upon, is evaluating the site using appropriate planning criteria, assessment tools, or evaluation activities for the intended land use to determine um, where soil carbon amendment will achieve um, the intended purposes. And my next slide uh, you know, touches upon uh, some things that match Matt mentioned about evaluating resource concerns um, and testing, uh, evaluating the site uh, before applying any salt amendment. Uh, they are test the soil prior to amendment application, use laboratories meeting current requirements and performance standards. Um, under the auspices of the Soil Society of America, or use an alternative state approved certification program. And you did see this slide earlier. Um, there are uh, resources available to our conservation planners to help um, evalu evaluate the resource concern. Uh, and you have that important client input planner observation, in field soil health assessment worksheets, uh, traditional soil tests. Soil health testing, uh, which is that uh, SEMA 216, uh, which it could be a comprehensive or a, a, a soil test looking for multiple soil health indicators, or you can have, if you're just interested in organic matter, you could just you know, uh, test for that. Uh, Russell 2 uh, model, uh, erosion tillage models, and that web soil survey interpretation that was mentioned. And then these are the resource concerns that the soil carbon amendment uh, uh, 336 uh, focuses on addressing. You know, Matt went through these earlier.
Okay, we're still on the, under the considerations. Uh, follow land grant university or industry guidance to collect, prepare, store, and ship soil samples. This is continuation of uh, when you're grabbing the, uh, the samples to test of the soil. Um, and ensure sampling protocol and lab soil test methods are the same as those required by state adapted um, conservation practice standards. And if you're um, implementing this standard um, alongside a new nutrient management code 590, it's another conservation practice standard. There are some uh, um, soil test methods uh, required there as well. And at a minimum, uh, we, we uh, want you to look at uh, the soil pH, the soil texture, soil organic matter or soil organic carbon, um, extractable phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sulfur, and magnesium, your CEC, you also want to be looking at um, other properties um, you may want to test for based on local conditions, your uh, bulk density, um, aggregate stability, available water holding capacity, and some of the other elements. And then this is some additional criteria for all amendments. Uh, prior to application, document the physical and chemical analysis, uh, the composition and, and properties of amendment per amendment category near the time of application. Current amendment analysis documentation shall be provided by the party that produces the amendment. Uh, so it's, an, it's important uh, um, the planner and the producer is, is applying the amendment, but we need to know the, uh, the all the chemical properties to match up with uh, to meet the objectives uh, of, of addressing the resource concerns based on what your original soil test of your site is is telling you. Is, you know, do you have a low pH? Do you have uh, some? Uh, you want to make sure you're selecting uh, whether it's biochar uh, with a certain uh, from a certain feedstock, or um, you want to make sure you're inoculating it with uh, compost or other amendments to address any nutrient needs. Um, and you wanna make sure that it is part of a, a comprehensive nutrient management plan as well. You wanna apply carbon amendments with minimal disturbance at a rate and time that will achieve the intended purpose. I know tomorrow we'll be discussing a lot on, uh, on application. Um, rates and, and methodologies, and uh, so look forward to that. Uh, evaluating the landscape soil properties, uh, evaluate the landscape soil properties, amendment composition, plant nutrient needs, and application rate to see if uh, nutrient management code 590 is needed to address nutrient related resource concerns. And do not apply any high salt materials where salinity is a concern. And then we have some uh, um, some conditions where uh, we do not want to apply amendments, uh, any amendments produced from crop residues that would otherwise provide soil protection and improve soil health. Um, or from woody residue that is necessary to sustain forest health and support wildlife habitat as referenced in Forest Stand Improvement Code 666. During high wind events, um, where soil site climate or conditions pose a significant risk due to slope, runoff potential, rainfall, irrigation intensity, or other factors, um, to areas where negative impacts of nutrient cycling may occur, uh, that uh, any amendments that may contain uh, undesirable plant propagules or seeds. And uh, the next bullet, uh, where changes to the plant community could be undesirable or unknown. For example, changing a native or an established desired community. And this is uh, focused on, on the rangeland uh, settings, um, native uh, rangelands where you have a native 
established native uh, vegetation and you uh, will be applying, you're considering applying uh, be it compost or a biochar or, or any other amendment that uh, may impact um, or the impact to the native plant community may be unknown or uh, undesirable. When nutrients in the amendment will not directly be used, um, for example, nutrient-rich amendments, applications to fallow lands or fields without existing or planned vegetative cover. Do not apply amendments such as raw manure or biosolids. When applying soil amendments such as raw manure and biosolids, refer to NRCS Conservation Practice Standard Nutrient Management Code 590, which has uh, considerations for um, uh, raw manure and uh, bio biosolids. For uh, considerations under operations under the National Organic Problem, we just basically are mentioning on that top paragraph just to follow all program regulations and to be in compliance. Uh, the next bullet, uh, look at, uh, um, we're, you know, we really emphasize the uh, impact, uh, uh, the, the critical amendment components such as looking at nutrients, nutrient interactions, uh, tox, toxicants, contaminants, when planning repeat applications. We want a, a monitoring plan to be based on that risk. And uh, the next statement is related to um, PFAS and other uh, uh, hydrocarbons, uh, PAHs and PCBs. Uh, we want to um, evaluate am the amendment as appropriate um, especially if uh, uh, the um, uh, the amendment is is, pro is from processed municipal waste feedstocks, so uh, those are things to evaluate the actual amendment for. We do have uh, uh, report values for all para parameters listed in uh, Table One. Table One is listed in the standard. Uh, we do want. Uh, a report on uh, you know the pH, the type of feedstock, the EC, the moisture content, um, and heavy metals. Uh, there are thresholds uh, from arsenic down to zinc there at the bottom. There are thresholds that um, that the amendment needs to fall within. Now, there, uh, we do have some considerations <clears throat> for each of the amendments that are listed. We'll start with biochar. Um, use biochar that is produced uh, by heating biomass to a temperature in excess of 350 degrees Celsius. Uh, controlled and limited oxygen concentrations to prevent combustion. Um, use uh, certified uh, biochar seal or one that meets a criteria in table three as determined by the methods in the IBI standards. You wanna document the origin of biochar and production method. Uh, uh, you wanna document all the parameters for all the carbon, all carbon amendments, table one, and there's also parameters for biochar amendments. And then again, using state approved or certified labs um, for, uh, for, for testing the amendments. And uh, we want to use uh, uh, per, per personal protective equipment. We have some specific uh, uh, parameters specific for biochar. Uh, I want to report the total ash, uh, limine equivalent. We want the uh, organic carbon range to be above 10. Uh, and thresholds for chromium is listed.
We do have some uh, parameters also, or conditions, I should say, for compost. These compost that is produced by the control uh, aerobic biological decomposition of biodegradable feedstocks. Use compost with uh, U.S. Composting Council seal of uh, assurance. And we want to make sure that they follow the criteria in Table 2, uh, as determined by the test message for evaluating compost. And we want to document the origin of the compost and parameters for all carbon units, Table 1. And here are some of the parameters for uh, compost amendments. And then again, uh, we do mention using state certified um, uh, laboratories, ensuring compost is screened as necessary to remove contaminants such as glass, metal fragments, film, plastic, hard plastic, and any sharp objects. Do not apply compost when a phos phosphorus risk assessment indicates a high or very high risk for phosphorus transport. Consider manufacture compost products that are low in soluble phosphorus. Ensure mitigating conservation practices to prevent run, runoff are in place. Um, we want to, especially if slopes that are greater than 8%, and we um, uh, recommend uh, that we do not apply soil carbon amendments on slopes greater than 15%. We want to uh, some some general considerations for all amendments. Um, we want to add mature stable compost that will increase uh, soil biological activity and diversify to enhance root health and promote resistance to pathogenic organisms. Apply a, a low hydrogen to organic carbon biochar to maximize your carbon sequestration. And I mentioned this earlier about uh, inoculating biochar with compost, compost tea, or manure to balance nutrients and nutrient interaction, stabilize pH, and improve amendment moisture content to aid application. And then we do mention about the uh, nutrient management code 590 is needed, um, which is a nutrient management plan to address nutrient related resource concerns. And then adjust the nutrient management and pest management plans as needed for the specific amendment type and purpose. And we have some, uh, um, some specifications on carbon to nitrogen ratios for compost, um, uh, any ratios of 30 to 1, uh, greater than 31, can immobilize nutrients, especially nitrogen. Um, Tar the target carbon to nitrogen ratio for compost and other amendments is 20 to 1. Carbon nitrogen ratios below 15 to 1 are likely to mineral mineralize nitrogen and should be used at a time when plant nitrogen demand will prevent nitrogen loss. And it also it's noted that biochar with high absorptive Adsorptive capacity can reduce the effectiveness of some pesticides. And here are just some considerations about uh, exhaust and emissions uh, for uh, the applicators uh, about diesel engines and your, on your farm equipment. Uh, consider life cycle analysis uh, of the amendment that evaluates the feed source, feedstock source processing and transportation impacts on carbon and greenhouse gas counting. Um, we have some tools available to our conservation planners to estimate changes in carbon and greenhouse gas emissions of planned practices, the Comet Farm and Comet Planner tool. On cropland, soil organic carbon is related to the volume of soil disturbed, intensity of the disturbance, Soil moisture content and soil temperature at the time of disturbance. Time of disturbance. 
make the, the, this practice most effective at increasing soil organic carbon stocks, improving soil health, and reducing carbon loss. Perform any deep soil disturbance, um, such as uh, ripping, subsoiling, or fertilizer injection. So that the vertical slot created by the implement is closed at, at the surface. And there's some uh, uh, other note about soil disturbance at a time when exposed soil carbon is less likely to be oxidized and lost. For example, when soil temperatures are 50 or below 50, or when soil is not excessively wet or excessively dry. And towards the end of the, of the standard, um, we have uh, plans and specifications. Uh, so there's a soil carbon amendment plan that uh, must be included, which includes a purpose of the practice, uh, the assessment of the listing of the resource concerns and, and, and uh, uh, what state approved tools were used to assess those resource concerns, your, your soil health lab test results, a map, uh, of, of your site and your conservation management units, which uh, would include some aerial uh, photographs, soil survey map of the site, any soil information uh, that was uh, gathered of your site, uh, so related to the physical and chemical properties of the, of the site. And it also mentioned about the web soil survey um, uh, soil survey uh, interpretation tab that you'll hear more about tomorrow. Plant information, including uh, um, existing invasive or noxious or rare wetland plant species. And a complete amendment analysis is required in the soil carbon amendment plan. Application rate, method, timing, and method of incorporation. Uh, finally, uh, a monitor monitoring plan for amendment effectiveness for the plan purpose using mo appropriate monitoring activities, include a soil organic matter or soil organic carbon test to determine the effectiveness of the application for improving soil health and soil organic carbon one to three years after application. Soil testing at three years or more after application may monitor longer term impacts. And just some uh, uh, calibration information about your application uh, equipment, um, inspecting and evaluating uh, surface applied amendments after the first heavy precip event to ensure that the material is stable and does not impact non-target areas, and evaluate the effectiveness of the amendment, um, application amount of cover provided, durability, and adjust future management or type of amendment to better meet the intended purpose. And uh, you may be wondering, well, how can I uh, see the standard? And uh, you know, Matt and I demonstrated earlier on navigating to your uh, field office technical guide. The website's there on the bottom. Um, and under section four, practice standards and supporting documents. I added a, uh, just wanted to mention I have a couple of slides on just job approval authority. So uh, the, it's certification granted to an individual who has demonstrated the appropriate knowledge, skill, and abilities of KSAs to plan, design, and certify installation of a given conservation practice. All of our conservation practice standards, over 160 of them, have um, a listed um, job approval authority that states. Um, develop for the conservation planners within their state. Um, so the KSAs are competencies required for ecological sciences job approval authority to plan, design, install, and certify the conservation practice according to the requirements of the standard. So we want to make sure uh, that the, uh, the planner, uh, the field uh, NRCS employee has the, the KSAs to be able to help plan and design and install and certify the, the practice. 
And here, uh, th these are some KSAs that were developed at the national level. Um, um, states may uh, add to it. Um, and it, it's basically, and states uh, have a system of, of, of providing training to their employees uh, on this. This is where the regional soil health specialists also within the soil health division uh, provide support to states on the technical tools and trainings um, on amendment materials. And this is where partners, uh, many partners, both federal um, and uh, industry professionals like uh, uh, yourself, uh, you know, play a role in, in, in providing technical uh, guidance. And the last couple of slides that I have um, is uh, we have a national biochar agreement Kristen Tripp will be uh, talking about that with ARS. Um, well, some of the work that she's doing uh, related to this uh, agreement uh, tomorrow. Um, it's a uh, uh, an agreement that provides training and outreach material targeted to to farmers, producers, technical service providers, conservation planners, and uh, biochar producers, manufacturers. Uh, purpose is to educate biochar producers about the regional market performance characteristics of biochar and value of uh, biochar products and uh, provide NRCS materials to train planners, including videos, webinars, and fact sheets to implement uh, our equip practices related to uh, including Soil Carbon Amendment 336. And that agreement um, works with many uh, partners to provide the tools and calculators for potential biochar users to, assault, to be, uh, help us select appropriate biochar product to meet appropriate goals, uh, calculate amendment, appropriate amendment rates, estimate financial costs and benefits of biochar amendment, and estimate greenhouse gas and carbon sequ sequestration benefits from biochar application. Um, coordinate training uh, and outreach to biochar producers to increase the representation of commercially available biochars within the biochar atlas. And John, that is my last slide, just we do have our non-discrimination statement, the end of our slide. I know I covered a lot there on the particulars of the standard. <laughs> Uh, you sure did. <clears throat> and the good news is we have a lot of questions. <laughs> we have a lot of questions for you. Um, uh, let's see, where should I start? Where should I start? Uh, the I, I think there's some confusion over the addition of biochar to manure management practices, um, whether or not that's something that'll be allowed. Uh, let's say somebody wants to put it in their manure lagoon and um, to control odors uh, and capture the nutrients and then compost it and apply it to their soils. Um, how will that work for them? Yeah, I mean, um, that, uh, let's see, to, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it can be used to control uh, odors, but uh, odors, um, uh, let's see, I mean, we do, if it's um, identified, uh, the, the the standard will pay for the application of, of either compost only, a biochar only, uh, or a mix of the two to to meet your objectives. And uh, the objectives need to be addressing uh, identified resource concerns. Now, the local planner field office. Uh, office identifies that situation that you just described. Uh, don't know all the details, but if there is a resource concern and that this standard can help address, um, then it, the standard supports uh, paying for the material and, and, and the insulation. Uh, okay. But, uh, yeah, and and uh, 
And I see there was a set um, that if, if others want to, was there a solid note that came in? I don't know if that came in to me or, but if you want to have other panelists chime in on to answer some of the questions. Yeah, I, and, and in fact, uh, I'm, oh, yeah. hey, this is, everybody, let me introduce Josiah Hunt, longtime board member for US Biochar, also a producer with Pacific Biochar. Uh, he's kind of pioneering in the field of converting biomass energy plants to have uh, biochar as output. Uh, he makes really excellent quality product. Uh, and then next to him, you see Tom Miles. Tom Miles is the executive producer for the or executive director. That's not TV, Tom. Uh, the executive director of the US Biochar Initiative. He's also a board member on USBI. Uh, clearly, and he's also a board member on the IBI. He uh, owns and operates TR Miles mm -hmm. Consulting, uh, specializing in wood boilers. And basically, if you have any questions about biochar in the United States, this man's probably the got more knowledge than uh, most of the other team combined. Um, we owe him a great, a great amount of debt, and and thanks for um, promoting biochar tirelessly in the United States, uh, Tom. So both these folks are qualified to help answer some of these questions. So let's go ahead and dig on in. Uh, I would also encourage any of the other panelists that feel like hopping in uh, to go ahead and do so now. I think it might just be best if we open this up as kind of a, a general Q&A. Uh, we'll go ahead and address some of the uh, more pressing concerns. And Josiah, start us out. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to go back to that last question, uh, Michael, which I think is a really good one because it kind of opens the door to some other things. So um, the the producer was asking, or the you know the farmer was asking here, uh, if they can use the biochar to uh, help with their manure management. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. If they can help with the manure management, utilizing the biochar either in the manure lagoon and or with the compost. Um, my general thought is that through the three three six program, the focus is the soil. So if the farmer is has soil that does have a resource concern, such as low organic matter, that they could use the biochar for that. And if they're using it in their manure management while on its pathway there, there should be no problem. It, it, I'm guessing, I'm, 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 I think that yeah. might be how it works. Is that correct? Uh, that, that's, that is, uh, uh, that sounds correct. Uh, you're using the, the, the soil carbon amendment for for your soil and and uh, the manure management uh, can be uh, supported by a 590 uh, nutrient management plan uh, standard, which uh, lists um, uh, uh, manure, compost, and and uh, other amendments focused on nutrient management. So it, so in combination of the two standards, you can. Um, it sounds like you can uh, incorporate that. And since and biochar, biochar can be used for that. Yeah, and since biochar um, uh, storage, you know, if, if you've got, got large acreage, you, you have to get a lot of biochar landed on your site and eventually out in the field. Storing it in combination with manure and compost can actually help address some of the storage concerns, uh, as well as if you're putting it in early stage compost can help improve some of the composting process and odor management and such. So it does seem like this could be a really important uh, um, utilization pathway for a lot of, a lot of folks. Uh, so I just, I just want to kind of highlight that just a little bit and confirm. So thank you for that. Yeah, we did have a question if compost tea is an allowable amendment under 336. Does anybody know if compost tea is allowable as an amendment under 336? Oh, compost is, 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 I'm is, sorry, Com compost, compost is allowable. Tea. Oh, oh no, they're asking tea. about compost tea. Yeah, oh, there are a lot of high-end compost tea providers these days. That, oh, okay, uh, I, I focus no, on biology. Oh, okay, yeah, compost tea is is is, is not uh, one of the identified amendments listed um, within the standard. Um, you can. Uh, we do encourage uh, inoculating biochar with compost tea uh, to meet nutrient management goals. And Michael, I see a question here from uh, Habir with the USDA NRCS um, asking why the biochar payment in cubic yards um, and compost in ton per acre? Oh, uh, 
Yeah. Um, we did touch on that a bit earlier. Right. Um, let me provide some. Uh, uh, I think it, 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 it's based on, on what the sources, uh, let's see, the majority of the sources used to contract the biochar component uh, uh, were in cubic yards. Okay. And, and, and uh, so in developing the payment rates uh, for the FY23, uh, the sources uh, were in cubic yards. Now that's this, uh, like I had mentioned uh, uh, sooner, I mean earlier, that uh, these scenarios are can be evaluated, units can be changed then, during the next cycle. Okay. That doesn't seem to be rock working or there's too many uh, challenge, challenges, but. Okay. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah, I have a question I wanna follow up on that somebody asked, um, why a 15% slope restriction? Is it absolute? Uh, it sounds like he lives in the Apple, he, they live in the Appalachians and that will rule out a lot of the pasture land there. Uh, is that something that the, the, the local NRCS agent should be able to resolve? Oh, on the, on the slope? On the um, slope restriction, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, for measure uh, for, uh, there is mentioned from eight to 15%, just as long as there's some measures to mitigate uh, runoff are in place. But um, right now the national standard basically limits uh, slopes uh, beyond 15%. Okay. Uh, another follow-up to the manure question is if a farmer applies biochar to their hay field as an amendment, and then they later spray that same field with the contents of the manure pit. Um, and I know this is kind of variant on what Josiah asked, but would that, would that still qualify uh, for, for funding? Well, if the, um, if the amendment was... Uh... Yeah, I mean, if, if uh, the, the amendment could have been contracted and then that was part of the plan to apply um, the compost or biochar in the field, um, that the planner would have to uh, go to the field and, and certify that that indeed has happened per the contract. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, Matt, if you want to, yeah going to any of the kind of the contracting or the planning specs if so it, it's basically what what is done if adding manure after the amendment uh, if that's allowable uh, I think you know it's yeah, that wasn't a, a, a nutrient management specialist but one of the, the in my example of the conservation plan we did talk about using biochar in combination with the nutrient management practice, which is the one that um, guides the application of organic or inorganic sources of um, plant nutrients to the fields. Um, I, I think they could be incorporated, but I, I think there would be some kind of uh, expert level assistance offered to understand the influence of the, the biochar incorporation on the the nutrient cycle, uh, something okay. I don't know about. Okay. So as as this uh, uh, as this practice is implemented, there's obviously going to be some learning along the way. Uh, is there a mechanism for modifying or adapting uh, three three six uh, as as we learn uh, more about uh, beneficial ways of applying biochar in combination maybe with other materials? Yeah, and if so, how do we submit those that input? Um, I, I agree with Tom because um, I've, I've received some direct text messages, folks that are concerned about some of the things they're hearing and they're wondering if they're, uh, you know, they may, some had comments in the open comment period before it was uh, introduced and then others did not. And they're wondering if it's possible to help build the program so it has uh, ultimate performance and uh, more adoption. Sure. sure. Um... Uh, the conservation practice standards are uh, updated every every five years, um, and with new technology, with everything that has been learned 
through um, the application of, of you know the first five years. Um, so yes, it, there's definite opportunity for um, updates to the standard, um, and any updates go, um, uh, would be open for public comment. And um, yeah, so uh, in the process for that, uh, we would be, you know, working with your, um, you know, states have a mechanism in place to communicate with the soil health division and ultimately the national discipline lead, whether it's uh, if I'm in this position at the time or someone else, uh, state, soil health point of contacts, uh, funnel that information on base, basically what is working, what is not working within okay. any soil health practices to their regional soil health specialist, which funnels that up to the national discipline lead, who is ultimately uh, responsible for updating the standard. And, right. and, yeah. and, and it's not just one person by themselves, they develop a quite a multidisciplinary team to uh, as what, what was developed to develop the standard, uh, what was organized to develop the standard. So there is a pathway. That's good. That's good. Uh, I'm sure you're going to have a lot. You're going to have a lot of contributions by the time this opportunity comes <laughs> around. Good. Yeah. So, uh, Josiah. Yeah, I'm seeing a, a variety of questions that are kind of all around the topic of biochar produced on site. Um, so farmers can produce compost on site uh, and still be part of the program, from what I understand. Are, are, are producers allowed to produce biochar on site? You know, farmer, producer allowed to produce biochar on site and that still be part of the program? And if so, how? Uh, let's see. Earlier, Alana mentioned that that was um, allowed and you'd have to work closely in concert with your local agent to make sure that the monitoring is in place uh, in, in order to, to verify the amounts that were utilized. Uh, right. And I do think we need to touch upon the fact that, you know, if you're using something like the ring of fire kiln or the big box biochar process or even pit, uh, pit creation uh, about the fact that you, you're gonna have to spend the money on the testing to make sure it qualifies. So it is have, gonna have to go to the lab and uh, right. that's, what is that? It's about $400 these, these days, approximately. So uh, there's some real world tests or uh, costs associated with that. Uh, let's see here, specific to the program, going through here. Well, there are a lot of questions in here about manure management. So uh, I think yeah. we're going to well, get I'd like to take an opportunity to bring up a, a question I've had uh, that I've got from um, we work with providing biochar to farmers that um, have been applying to the 808 interim practice um, based here in California. And so I know it's different state by state. And so this is a question about you know, how some of those differences occur. Um, in California, uh, with our clients, there's been a lot of focus on the allowable um, money per acre, not based on per yard, but the allowable the allowable funds through the 808 program uh, per, on a per acre basis, uh, and that's been consistent with the multiple clients that we've spoken with, and and so what you guys have presented today, and in reading the practice standard, I don't see anything that supports that, and I've also gone through uh, while we're looking today and, and look through the field guide, um, the field office technical guides, and I couldn't find that specification on a per acre. So I'm wondering where you think this might come from and um, uh, how we could find more information about that. Okay, yeah, I can. Um, so on the pay payment scenarios and, and Matt could fill in too, uh, the there's a, a typical scenario and many of those typical scenarios are on a one acre basis and there's a uh, there's a uh, a price of uh, biochar and or compost uh, uh, that would be supported for that typical scenario but you know that's for the cost of uh, one acre during the contracting 
phase. Uh, you know, the unit may be uh, uh, the area of interest or your application. It may be two or three acres or five acres. Well, at the contracting uh, phase, when you're under contract, that price is, is used on that five acres. Um, so we're not just paying on just a, a one acre uh, payment. Okay. And I think so I, it's I think at I the contracting, it's, it's adjusted based on what is contracted and then what, how many acres you have. Okay. I think that clarified it. We want to thank everybody for presenting today. This is the end of the official session. We are sh very shortly going to hop into uh, the panel discussion with the extended Q&A uh, for another bit. We have scheduled up to about 45 minutes, but it's entirely optional. So tomorrow on day two, you're going to see Tom, Tom and Josiah and Kristen and a number of others that are going to hop in and be available tomorrow. Um, so uh, same Zoom link, same Zoom time. So we want to thank you for for that. Um, and then I believe that I have a screen here with all our socials. So I want to encourage you to follow both USBI and the USDA folks on the, the social media channels. So uh, with that said, uh, you're all, any of you going through the uh, CEU program, uh, if your, your time is now allotted for, but um, let's go ahead and we'll start into the extended Q&A. Okay, thanks again to Michael. That was session four of day one on the NRCS code 336 low carbon amendment. We wanna thank the amazing NRCS Soil Health Division team for the deeply informative details on this practice. Michael really did give an amazing presentation today. Next up, we hop into an extended Q&A session to dig deeper into your 808 and 336 questions. It has fantastic participation by attendees and is worth clicking on the next video in the series. We want to thank our sponsors, which make programs like this possible. Please contact USBI about sponsoring future programs. Watch, like, subscribe, and then share these videos.